The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Now, we're being preempted. This happens a couple times a year. We're being preempted. Uh, house group leaders have already notified all your constituency into small groups for the benefit of those who are not in a small group. Um, no service September 20th in this room. That's next Sunday. That's next Sunday. All right. It's being preempted. They're having some big to do where they rent out all the rooms in the whole building, and that means we get preempted. <laughs> Hotels do the same thing. I started a church in a hotel, and they would give you a nice reasonable rate for the room in the hotel, the little meeting room. But if some business comes in with, and buys a block of 10 to 15 rooms, you're out. <laughs> so it makes sense. It's good business sense for them to do that. But we will stream, uh, regardless, we will stream <clears throat> um, the program, but there will not be a meeting here in this room. What day? September what? 20th. Is that next Sunday? Yes. Two days before my birthday? Two days after Vicky's. And I let Vicky know, don't I? I? I let her know for four days. I'm going, I just agree with whatever you say because I respect my elders. <laughs> I get to do that for four days. Whatever you say, Vicky, I mean, I, I respect my elders there, so... At least for four days, anyway. So, all right. Did I make all the important announcements that we're not meeting in this room? Okay. <clears throat> all right, let's just pray. Father, we want to do part two to what we've been uh, teaching lately. We've been getting good response from it uh, from our uh, video audience as well. And they're asking good questions. So I'm just going to ask it by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would minister to us at the point of our need in our life. We want that nugget out of, out of a whole message. Sometimes there's one nugget that will effectively transform my heart and attitude and bring me to a whole new level of freedom in Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> this is uh, part two of the God emotions. Now, that's our term, God emotions, but uh, we use that to get people's attention. In reality, biblically... It's Galatians 5.22, or the fruit of the Spirit. Now, do you notice, the fruit of the Spirit, there's only one fruit, love. But it expresses itself. You know, it's, uh, joy is nothing more than love rejoicing, etc. Peace is love resting and ruling. So never minimize when you feel peace, because peace is the manifestation of the love of God. If it's supernatural, it's God. So peace is not nothing. When you feel peace on the inside, he himself is our peace. And that's love resting and ruling. So you are, you're, don't, don't look for gushy love feelings all the time because the fruit can be expressed in many different ways. And <clears throat> uh, I want us to recognize the kingdom of God is within you and the kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit which is basically the God emotions. The kingdom of God or the rule of God is basically emotion, but it's not carnal emotions. And people get so confused. You have three sets of emotions. You have, if you stubbed your toe, that's physical pain. You feel that, so we use the word feel. When you have emotional pain, you feel hurt, wounded, anger, fear. But there's spiritual feelings that we wanna see the body of Christ enjoy. And think about this. We know the miraculous is significant. And in Jesus' ministry, the miraculous was for three years. But for 30 years, he walked in the fruit of the Spirit. He walked as a perfect man. Now, it's not as flamboyant as the gifts of the Spirit, but he was an expression of the love of God 
And so he showed us what it was like to be human. We use that the wrong way. We say, when you mess up, what do we say? <laughs> I'm just human. We mean it in a negative way. Jesus came and through the incarnation showed us what being a human should look like. And it's not real flamboyant. It's walking in the, in the love of God, but it's peace. It could express itself as peace. It could express, express itself as patience. Uh, when I was in the school of the Spirit as a young believer, God showed me that patience was that whatever the world uh, uh, and circumstances and people were doing, if I held my heart open to God, like, what are these crazy people doing? Or what negative circumstances is happening? If I held my heart open, I developed patience. And from that peace or holding the heart open, you actually get better at it. And you respond instead of react. It's like when Jesus had his earth walk. I'm talking before he ministered miracles. That it was, it was basically like wearing your spirit on the outside and the soul being on the inside, responding the way the spirit wants it to respond, not the way your flesh wants to manifest. Manifestation of the flesh only tells you Jesus isn't ruling. But the rule of God, let the peace of God rule. And the God of peace, this is militant, because the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. You see how important peace, peace is not passive. It's not some kind of, oh, just whatever will be, will be. You know, peace is actually militant. It'll crush negative under your feet. It'll crush the enemy beneath your feet. So we have to see it as armor. The peace of God, the scripture says, will guard your heart and your mind. Well, if that's if the, either the word of God is, is, is telling me a lie or I haven't learned how to let the peace of God guard my heart and my mind. I haven't been wearing the armor properly. Um, <clears throat> so here's an easy way, uh, and it's a missing truth, I think, not often repeated enough because we were taught, when I was a young Christian, I was taught, ignore your feelings. You can't live by your feelings. And that's only a half-truth. You can't live by those carnal feelings. They'll tell you all kinds of weird stuff. But you can live by spiritual feelings or the fruit of the Spirit or the God emotions. And after all, that's why God made you an emotional being. Not to give you problems. He made you an emotional being so that you could actually feel the joy of the Lord. Not just, ah, oh, the joy of the Lord, that's a nice concept. I don't have any, but I'm sure it's a good thing. Right? He made emotions for you to feel it. And in the garden, they walked in the fruit of the Spirit until sin entered. When sin entered, immediately, do you see what kind of emotions emerged? When sin entered, all of a sudden, they were afraid. They blamed that woman you gave me. She, that's her fault. They covered themselves. They hid. They were afraid. They were guilty. They were ashamed. Hurt. Fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, all came after sin entered. Otherwise, they never had those feelings. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame came, and they're like, their flags are indications that it's the other kingdom that's operating. So they, in a sense, it could be your friends. Next time you feel hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, say, Jesus isn't ruling right now, I am. And it, it will bring you into a place to where you can deal with it. All right. Now, <clears throat> because Jesus is our peace, when peace rules, he rules. Peace is evidence of lordship. How many have heard you people say over and over again, well, he's not just my savior, he's my lord. Okay. Then all kingdom life people say, oh, how do you do that? This is where you people will drive all guest speakers. If you ever go to a conference, drive them nuts because this is still the missing element. They can tell you what to do, but not how to do it. And I'm tired of hearing, just have faith. Just believe. We have to teach people how to believe from the heart as opposed to trying intellectually to believe something. Belief is not of the head, it's of the heart. And you need the title deed or the assurance in the heart. <clears throat> the divine humanity or the expression of God is, we could say, Jesusly human. That's being human, not, oh, I'm just being human because I'm a jerk. Or I messed up, so I'm just human. 
Yes, yes you are. <laughs> but at the same time, Jesus is saying, I want you to see the expression of the Father. Do you know that the Holy Spirit is different since the day of Pentecost than it was in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people. The difference is on the day of Pentecost, there's an incarnation to where the expression of the Holy Spirit is that you could have Jesus in you. And he wants his humanity or the fruit of the Spirit to be expressed through you. Then couple that with the gifts of the Spirit like his ministry and you've got a demonstration of a holiness, love, and power. And that's what we're looking forward to. The next great awakening is going to be exemplified by holiness and love, character, fruit of the Spirit, and power. Both. Not one or the other. And keep in mind, what does the scripture say? There's going to be many that come to me and say, did I not prophesy? Didn't I cast out devils? And he says, depart from me, I knew you not. You didn't draw close to me. You know what, the, how many know the parable of the virgins? Okay. They were to have their oil filled. That's not gifts. To have your soul flooded with God, filled with God, is having your, having your vessel filled. The foolish virgins just thought they could just live on, on the unction of their gifting. Gifting can get you places that your character won't be able to keep you. You have to have both. And both is going to be absolutely necessary in the days ahead. When you read, look at the, uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew expressed the kingdom. Mark emphasized the servant of the Lord. Um, John, Jesus, deity, uh, the incarnate living God, and Luke, the perfect man, the man, Christ Jesus, okay? And so he, Luke expresses his humanity, and that's, that's really what I believe God is, is speaking in this time, that we need to be expressions, the highest level of communication is not your words, which the church is very strong on. Decree, declare, preach, confess, right? Give the word, and that's all very important, but at the same time, not at the expense of saying all the right words without the unction behind it. You can say all the right answers. Every word that comes out of your mouth, you, like two invisible lines, like I would say, Jennifer, I love you. There's two things coming out of my mouth. There is the communication of the actual words. What did I just say? Jennifer, I love you. The other one is the authority or anointing or lack of anointing authority on the words. So every word that comes out of your mouth is connected. Now, here's a simple way to teach uh, 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 even a new believer to give them a perception of how you want your words to have the right source. All right, And this is the easiest way. We taught this. I think third graders gotta, could get this one. Are you smart as a third grader? All right, you'll get this one then. All right, Mind, will, and emotions, your soul. We want the spirit to rule those three, all three, not two, all three. But here's what it's like. Your mind is like a steering wheel in a car. Your mind can go all different, it can go to the right, it can go to the left, it can go up, it can go down, it can go all over the place, can it? You ever lay in bed at night and not do a single thing and the mind going zoo, 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 all over the place? You can... But the will would be like the gear shift. That's your will. You put it in, you make a choice. You act on it. That's your will. You can sit and rev the engine all you want, but until you put it in drive, it ain't going anywhere. Until you make a choice to act on it. Okay? So that's initiation, the gear shift. But this is the missing link the missing ingredient that's been minimized and needs to be maximized in order for the fruit of the Spirit to materialize, 
oh, that was almost a poetry. <laughs> but, but the motor is the emotion, the source, the power behind the words. I learned as a baby Christian and memorized uh, certain scriptures that I was being taught faith. They'd say, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Have you heard that? You've heard that plenty of times. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. But then I would say, what does that mean? And they would say words. And that is only half accurate. It's not the words. It's the power behind the word. It's the motor. It's the source. Have you ever been complimented and it wasn't real? <laughs> Uh, Dennis, I love you. A pastor, I, I, there's times that someone had said, Pastor, I love you, and I wish they wouldn't have. Because <laughs> bless their heart, as they say in the South, they were trying. <laughs> I love you, but it felt like <sniffs> on the inside. That's called your discerner. Have you ever discerned someone said something nice, but it wasn't real? That's your discerner saying what's a Attached to those nice words doesn't feel nice. Or ladies, have you, ever, have you ever had somebody say something seductive to you and it sounded like a comment, but it felt like you wanted to go take a shower? Hmm? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, you can get so hung up on not judging that you quit discerning. You have a capacity in your spirit to discern the nature of or the authority that's attached to words. So, my mind is a steering wheel. I can go all over the place, but as long as I don't engage any of those thoughts, like, oh, those kids, those kids, those, those kids, they've been so bad yesterday, I'm gonna kill those kids when I get up. <laughs> as long as you don't kill them, then that's just a, that thought is just a steering wheel. But the motor behind it is what? Anger, frustration, if you don't deal with that frustration, you give power to what you give attention to. You keep giving attention to laying up, oh, I'm gonna kill those kids, I'm like, I can't believe they did that, that, they don't, that, that girl, she didn't go to school, she didn't do her homework, uh, he didn't do this, he didn't do that, and oh, oh my goodness, oh, 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 oh. The, the, the motor is frustration. Unless you deal with your frustration, you're not gonna do God's will in their behalf. You can call it love, when you punish them. But if you're still angry and all bent out of shape, what's attached behind it doesn't minister love. I'm trying to teach people, even in an abusive situation where someone is uh, being verbally abusive to you, if you can learn to let the peace of God rule while they're doing it, otherwise you will render evil for evil. You'll fight control with control. But if you can stay at peace, the scripture is not lying when it says, peace will guard your heart and your mind. That means peace is like armor and peace is really superior to any arrow or dart that anybody can throw at you with their mouth. Isn't that nice to know? But you got to practice that. And I'm not telling you to do this, but just to give it. When God would teach me these things, he would, in some cases, give me extreme examples to learn the lesson by. But then you never forget. Forty, forty some years later, I could still remember. Uh, I worked at a halfway house with uh, uh, convicts that were going to be released in, back into uh, society. And in the halfway house, uh, there were certain rules. What was interesting is even as a baby Christian, if someone was going to make a break for it, there would be a tension, a discernible tension. Nobody said anything, but you could feel the atmosphere shift. Like, mm. and I'm standing by the only exit. And procedure said that if they make a break for it, you call the police. You don't attempt to stop them, except verbally. No, you don't want to do it, but if they go, they go. I'm standing by the only exit. And God was teaching me in the school of the Spirit. At that point, I was such a new Christian. He said, I'm, I don't want you to go to Bible school yet. I want to teach you in the school of the Spirit before you do any Bible school. 
And I'm looking back now, I'm glad because the Bible school enhanced your life, but he showed me things that, that were not there, per se. And I'm standing by the only exit, and a guy did not take his meds, grabbed a knife, and was coming at me and saying, get out of the way or I'm going to cut you, I'm out of here. And don't try this at home. But supernaturally, the peace of God increased. Increased! I didn't make it happen. I didn't try to believe. It increased. And I wasn't going to move. And I stood there for what seemed like hours, and it was seconds. <laughs> and, but the peace of God was so comforting. And from that time on, I saw him with that knife. The next thing you know, his hands shaked. He dropped the knife, dropped to his knees, and they gave him his medication. Um, but God said, there. The peace of God really will guard your heart and your mind. Now, I don't tell you to go in a dangerous situation and trust the peace of God. You don't make it happen, but you do from that place of peace. God might tell you, get out of the way. God might tell you, don't get out of the way. From peace, you can get instruction. You can have an awareness of what to do. Now, if I would have been there in the peace of God, he pulled his knife. And I had a piece to go, fine, go. You know, we'll call the police. I would have done that as well. Let the peace of God rule. If, if even if, if a business person would not make business decisions till you had a peace, you would make better decisions. People make too many decisions, even in business, out of fear, hurt. All the decisions you make out of fear, even if you think it's a good decision, more than likely the timing will be bad. And it's still the wrong motive. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. You don't live by fear and you don't make your decisions by fear. You let the peace of God rule. I think there's some people should be challenged with the peace challenge. We have a peace challenge just for that. Five elements on your day-to-day -day activities. How to let the peace of God rule. How to let it evangelize. How to let it guard your heart and mind. How to let it guide you prophetically, how to let it ground you in a fruit of the Spirit and live in the humanity of Jesus. Now, um, <clears throat> the, the other thing is you need to deal with the emotion. I, I want to give a couple examples that I've seen in the church over the years that really doesn't work well, but we've all been taught this. Um, how about um, changing the subject does not bring about a supernatural exchange, changing the subject. I've seen people say, how many of you people have suffered rejection and watched people in the audience crying because you, you, you hit a button? And it brought to their mind the pain that they had suffered, either growing up or recently. How many said that rejection? Come forward to the altar. This is Pentecostal charismatic type church especially. Come forward to the altar. Lift up your hands and worship Jesus. Well, you know, while you lift up your hands and worship Jesus, you just changed from rejection to something pleasant. You might even think you got ministry until you think about the rejection and the pain comes back. Changing the subject is not redemption. Changing the subject. And we were taught this as young boys. Pastor, I'm having lustful thoughts. What do I do? He says, go to the Word. Isn't that what you would tell? Go to the Word. So you read your Bible, oh, Jesus and Judas went out and hung himself and everything. But as soon as I'm done reading, <laughs> as soon as I'm done reading, a lustful thought came right back. Changing the subject is not going to provide a solution. You have to bring that thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. Two weeks ago we did a whole thing on how to bring a thought captive. And you need, to, you need a review on that one. But what I wanted to cover today <clears throat> was that the motor or the power behind thoughts, the power behind actions. And when Jennifer was so impressed, she has all the uh, degrees, she has so many degrees, we call her Dr. Fahrenheit. <laughs> 
But she had all the psychology degrees, but what I taught her in the first few weeks we were married worked. And she had seen Christian counseling and everything not work for the most part. Uh, occasionally there's some, somebody that, thank God we have counselors. Uh, some people wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for psychiatrists, psychologists, and counselors. But on the other hand, for a believer, the ultimate solution is always Jesus. Why not find out how to let Jesus do what he says he can do and be the answer? All right? So I don't even want to get into that too much. But when Jennifer saw that what I was showing her was that you emphasize the thoughts in psychology. I said, I'm emphasizing the power behind the thoughts. And if you go to the emotion first, and he himself takes our pain, our shame, our sorrow, nobody else can. The only thing you can do is suppress it or medicate it. Emotions don't die, they get buried alive. The only way emotions change is the fruit of the Spirit, and that's a supernatural transaction. You can't make that happen other than God. This does not work on unbelievers. Unbelievers have to learn to cope. But if they had Jesus, they could actually have toxic emotions internally transformed into the fruit of the Spirit. You can't get the fruit of the Spirit if you're not a believer. I'm sorry. It's the love of God. You've got to get the love of God in first. <laughs> Somebody always says, can an unbeliever do this? formula. No, it's not a formula. It's a relationship with Jesus. But it's a supernatural transaction or a supernatural exchange. So <clears throat> she started doing some study and found out that biology since 19... Since 1999 has started teaching emocognition, emovolition. That's a fancy way of saying the emotions control your thinking, the emotions control your choices. Now you can override it temporarily, but the emotions don't die. They get buried alive and they're going to manifest at some other point when somebody scratches you just the, just the right way. The only way is transformation. It's redemption is the name of the game for the believer. And it's the blood of the cross that actually, through forgiveness, that can change and transform toxic emotions into healthy fruit of the Spirit. Without the cross, it doesn't work. And I've watched all the methods, if you want to call it that, of well-intentioned Christians trying to help people. But in reality, if you avoid the work of the cross and there's not an actual redemption, you know, even non-charismatic, you go to any Baptist uh, Bible school and they will teach you that repentance must be mental, volitional, and emotional or it's not legitimate. I'm saying the same thing. If the mind, the will, and the emotions, if all three, as a matter of fact, in the Greek word, um, what is that, uh, Romans 12, 1 or 2? 12, 1, where it says having... Uh, your mind, offering your mind. We read, what do we, when we read the word mind in our Bible, we think this, but it's actually in the Greek, it's N O U S, nous. That is your mindset, mind, will, and emotions. If all three are not touched by the Spirit of God, two of them won't change you. Mind, will, and emotions are like three bad little kids. And it doesn't matter which one is surfacing, but he's going to take the other two with him. Yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> yeah, let's be bad. I want to hurt. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Do it then. All right? But if all three sub come underneath the authority of Jesus, it's like a sail in a sailboat, and the wind of the Spirit goes through that mind, will, and emotions and directs your life in a favorable way. The wind of the Spirit blows through the mind, will, and the emotions. He doesn't want to annihilate your mind, will, and emotions. He doesn't want you to pretend like you don't feel. That's the, uh, that's the other one. But, uh, I don't feel nothing. I'm a man. I'm, boys don't cry. I don't have any emotions. And that's when Jennifer goes, you know, what they mean is they don't have any good emotions. We've seen you on the road. We know you, <laughs> we know you have emotions. <laughs> don't say you don't. I've seen you driving. Okay. Um, 
So what men, we don't use emotion, emotion, emotion. This is probably driving men crazy right now. Uh, we use stress. Stress. You know what the definition of stress is? To be emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. What if you learned in a hostile environment to let the peace of God rule? I had, I had uh, 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 emergency room nurses in my first pastorate and um, all different aspects of nursing. I had four of them. All four of them learned something that I taught them that you don't have to be high level stress on the job thinking that makes you sharper. It actually diminishes your IQ when you're under stress. By how many points, Jennifer? 20, 20 points. I can't afford 20 points. And most of you can't either. Here's what I taught them. That if you could stay in, because they, they want to depersonalize themselves so they don't get emotionally attached to the patient, right? I understand that. I don't want to be emotional. I don't want to start crying over my patients here. Then I, will be, I won't be functioning. Well, detaching doesn't work either because you're going to go home and decompress. All right, what goes down will come up. It, what is suppressed will be expressed later. But why not try this? I says, do the best you can to stay at peace even in an emergency room situation. And if you stay at peace, you're operating mentally at optimum. Don't you want to accomplish as much as possible? <laughs> you're operating at optimum. You keep your peace. And what they found was not only were they able to do their job, and it was a struggle because it, it comes by reason of use. You have to practice. It's a, you don't do it one time and go, oh, I'm going to do that from now on. You're going to hit and miss until you get more proficient at it. You're going to recognize at first that you're, you are unconsciously incompetent now. You're going to find out later that you are consciously incompetent at keeping your peace. But then eventually you'll become consciously competent. And then you become unconsciously competent. There's a progression. Practice makes permanent. So here's what they learned. They learned that they could keep their mind on the emergency situation and they had a protocol to follow, but there were certain areas and times when they felt by the peace of God ruling to break a little bit of the protocol and go check on a room that wasn't really necessary. And they were discovering, I'm, I, that must have been God that led me to that because I wasn't on my agenda, but I felt led from the place of peace to go check on that room and, and, and corrected uh, a negative situation. That's the leading of the Holy Spirit. He can lead you in those high, high press things, but it takes practice. By reason of use, having your senses exercised to discern. Discern, remember, means to distinguish or to differentiate the source. And for a believer, your source is God. And in the activity of what we would call stress, people and circumstances, the more you can walk in peace, the more you will accomplish. Something about the mind that always intrigued me is, you know, you can make a mountain or a molehill out of a situation. You have that capacity. One person's molehill will be someone else and put them over the edge. The same situation. But the beautiful thing in God is big and little do not exist. Big and little is our perception. What did Jesus say? Is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? Uh, for me, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven than take up your bed and walk, but not for him. So if he's ruling in your life, big and little take on a whole new approach. And you, we're going to do, let's do that right now. We're going to take any mountain in your life right now and recognize that I've exalted that mountain. I'm going to speak to that mountain to be removed. I made it bigger than it needs to be. I did that with this little pea brain of mine. But other people in the identical situation will minimize it. So Father, right now, that, those things that seem like mountains, proud, arrogant things that have exalted itself against the knowledge of God in my life, I receive forgiveness for having allowed that to be there. I humble myself 
and I relinquish it, and I receive forgiveness for making that big, bigger than it needed to be. Cleanse me. And when you can picture that and feel peace in the gut, there was a supernatural transaction. And the blood of forgiveness did what only the blood can do. Cleanse, wash, restore. And he replaces the negative with the fruit of the Spirit so that you can express it. When we've prayed with people over the years, you know, the first thing they said is, I can talk about that situation and it doesn't bother me anymore. Why? The situation didn't change, but the power behind the situation has been transformed into the presence of God. It doesn't have any power. It would be like um, if I was a professional golfer and I heard, you're a total failure. I might agonize over that and have to deal with it. But if somebody told me I was a bad golfer and I have zero interest in golfing, there's no power behind the statement. Dennis, you're a bad golfer. Oh, <laughs> you're cute too. Oh, you know. Oh, yeah. Bless you too. It's the power behind the statement. And so where there's mountains in your life, there's a root, which is really what I was trying to get to for the message today. Do I have time, Jennifer? She's looking at her watch. I don't know. All right. Here's what I want to cover. Hebrews 12, 14, 15. This is a sermon. All of that was the lead up. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. Pursue peace with all people. What does all mean? <laughs> yeah, that means even love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Speak well of them. Do good to them that hate you. Okay. All right, now that, now that we've got everybody repentant, pursue peace with all people and sanctification. Everything I'm talking about is sanctification, getting areas freed up and more under the authority of Jesus. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. A tree is identified by its fruit. If you see the fruit, there's a root. A good tree doesn't bear bad fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears has a root. Root to fruit. <laughs> Tested by the fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. If the tree's bad, its fruit's bad. Toxic emotions are not sin, but the unforgiveness of dealing with them is. All right, like I said, they can be your friends telling you that the, Jesus isn't ruling. A bitter root causes trouble. If you look at Hebrews 12, 15, and I'm going to close with this, but I just want you to see this one verse because it's very applicable and you can apply it very easily to your own life. A bitter root, that means unresolved negativity in you, causes you trouble. So if you're interested in eliminating trouble, recognize that when you're bitter, hanging on to a grudge, a hurt, a wound, a fear, a lust, an anger, a guilt, a shame, as long as you're holding on to it, it's causing you trouble. And not only is it causing you trouble, but it probably formed an early childhood. So you may forget about it, Oh, I hated this part. You can forget about it, but it's still operating. That's why I needed Jesus. Because just because you forgot about a hurt or a wound or a bitter root doesn't mean it's not operating in your life. You should see that you probably see the fruit and say, I don't know why I do that. Or worse, you'll say, that's the way I am. Take me as I am. You know, that's just the way I am. No, that's not God. That's not the new creation you. That's not the God that loves God and His Word. You, it's a different you. It's your flesh. No. Nevertheless, it still produced a harbor, harbor of trouble in adulthood. And yet I've seen this so beautifully resolved. I've had a, 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 
a woman one time that got ministry and she just hated men. And she tossed around getting married, but then it never worked out. She just decided to stay single. But she hated men. Prayed with her, and you know where it came in? It came in, Dad. One healing, one. Well, my dad left when I was a little girl. I don't trust men. She prayed that through and forgave her dad for leaving. I'm not talking about whether he was right or wrong. We're talking about you getting free. Forgiveness frees you. Because remember, it causes you trouble. When it gets rid of the trouble in you. She released forgiveness to her dad. And what's funny is clarity is one of the indications that someone's done it from the heart. All of a sudden, it's like the light bulb goes on. You could tell them the same thing, but they can't hear it. Because the wound is covering their heart and mind. But the minute she gave it, this is a person, a woman who hated men. I've got Jesus inside. There's a man inside of me called Jesus. Oh, my goodness, there's a man in there. But it was like an epiphany. Someone else could have said that and it would have meant nothing. But once she forgave dad, like there's no formula for this. It's just... It's not you searching your heart. It's letting God search your heart. He'll show you stuff you'd have never thought of that you forgot about it. So it springs up. It causes you trouble. But when you deal with it, it opens up a whole realm of freedom that you never knew existed. The source can be a bitter root. And yes, you can forget just because you can't remember. That's why I struggle with Christian. I can't, I can't figure it out. I don't know what I thought about everything. It isn't about you searching yourself. God who knit you together in your mother's womb, if someone's going to search you, let God search you, not people. Really. You don't need people searching you. You need God searching you. He's smarter than all of them. If he knit you together in your mother's womb and wrote you in the, all your days are numbered and written in the book. If there's a tangle in there, who would you rather trust to untangle something? I'd rather go to the author. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't ask the thing. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, go to the creator. Right? If you don't know how to operate your, uh, your computer, don't ask the computer. Ask the one who built the computer for you, all right? All right, bitter root. It causes you trouble. Secondly, bitter roots disrupt relationships. Do you know how many people have suffered and say, I've been married three times, to, and each time it was to an alcoholic. Their logical mind knew that there's something wrong with that pattern, but something in them overrides logic. There's a motor on the inside. There's a bitter root that is actually not only causing them trouble, but it's reaping a harvest. And their head may have known, I'm getting in trouble. But their heart is being ruled by something else, another motivation. It disrupts relationship. It's how we see others. If, like, say that woman had a bitter root toward men before she got healed. She would see men through a lens. And you could be practically a walking Jesus, and she would have seen a flaw. That flaw is not there. That flaw is coming from the heart. You want to have the eyes of Jesus, you have to have the heart of Jesus. If you've got something ugly in the heart, it's going to color the lens of your perception. You need the heart of Jesus to have the eyes of Jesus. You want to see from his perspective, you've got to get healed on the inside. Most people are judging other people by their own hurts. And quite frankly, and to be real blunt, in the political realm right now, it's mirror imaging. It's embarrassing. For someone who has learned to discern from the Spirit from the time I was a baby Christian, right now you don't need discernment. Everything they accuse somebody of, they themselves do. 
It doesn't even take discernment. Just listen carefully to what they accuse somebody else of is the very thing they do. It's their character and their nature. It's like a mirror. What do they call that in psychology? Projection. They're just projecting their own heart on everybody else. If I got murder in my heart, you're a murderer. That's your problem. You're a murderer. You're just, you're just projecting what's in you. And it doesn't even take spiritual discernment. Evil is so obvious now, and hatred is so obvious that you say, and you know, I used to have, in my first church, I had people so blown away by worldly people. I'm going, they're just acting like unsaved people should act. And actually, I think now we're finally seeing what they really act like. Because if it wasn't for the grace of God, I actually think they'd be worse apart from God, but now they're not hiding the stuff as much as they used to. Bitter roots rob us of the presence and the power of God. So it hurts us in our relationships because you see through that lens. Get, get the heart fixed and the lens gets clear and you get clarity. I just love it. Uh, I was rejected by my father growing up. I was invisible. He could see my two sisters, but I was invisible. And I always thought it was very strange. I joked about it, but it hurt. But then found out, as I got a little older, my dad was illegitimate. And my grandfather was ashamed of my dad. My dad went to college, got a degree, worked his way up as an engineer, did all of these accomplishments, would run home and tell his dad, which is what rejected people do, right? They overcompensate. You know, I did this and I did and My grandpa would just look at him and look right through him and say, your sister made a jello salad yesterday that was really good. <laughs> his wounding and his guilt of having an illegitimate child made him, made my dad invisible. He couldn't face his own, didn't know how to face it. He was a non-believer. He didn't, he didn't know how to cope, and that was the way he coped. I just erase you. That way I don't hurt. Well, that's generational. My dad was raised with that level of rejection. When I was born, he passed it on to me. I get saved, and I see how bitter roots operated, and I released forgiveness to my dad. I said, he doesn't ever have to pay attention to me. I accept him just because I'm accepted in the beloved. And God gave me such an anointing of being accepted by him that I didn't need him, but I needed to release him and pray for him. And you know that day came when I was a young pastor and I had an altar call. I want all the men to come forward that never heard an affirming word through a male voice and receive acceptance and healing for rejection. And I open my eyes, and there's my dad, tears pouring down his face, standing in front of me. Now, I could have just stayed bitter and rejected and told everybody about my owies. Ooh, I was rejected my whole wife. Or I could deal with the rejection, get my need met by God, who gives more than enough acceptance. He gave me, and here was his term. I'm giving you my undivided attention. Dennis, you're the apple of my eye, the center of my attention. My thoughts are continually towards you. That just melted my heart. Continually, nobody, human could do that. I have to go to sleep. And then I even started crying that I wanted to reciprocate and give God undivided attention. I said, but I can't. I can't stay that focused. I'll think of something off. I'll go off tangent. I'll go, I have to sleep. I got, and God says, I've given you a capacity to give me your undivided attention in your spirit. It's not a soulish activity. Your spirit can commune with me 24-7. That was our first book, Live Free. I strongly suggest you get the book, Live Free, because that came out of a life. It's not theory. But God taught me that in prayer, I'm with someone. There's special time and all the time. I don't go in and out of prayer. 
I know many Christians see, have a concept. I was in prayer, then I came out and hoped my battery lasted all day. I got charged. No, there's special time and there's all the time. And Jesus set that example for us, didn't he? He had special time in prayer, but he had all the time, moment by moment, 24-7. That's what God wants to equip us with. Bitter roots cause you to reap a bitter harvest. If you see a particular crop in your life, it could be finances, it could be broken relationships, it could be failures in a certain area where other areas seem to work, but then there's this area, there's a bitter root that you could say, God, show me where that got started in my life. Let's resolve that. Cleanse that out of me because it will reap a harvest. If you don't like the harvest you're getting, find out where's, if it's fruit, right? What's the root? And I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to go to humble myself and ask God to show me. And you'd be shocked how quickly stuff will come up and go, I never thought of that. That's usually a good sign, by the way. <laughs> if you're praying and you go, I never thought of that, good. You didn't figure it out on your own. It just kind of surfaced. God searches the heart better than man. And that includes you. Now, if... If we're going to remove the root, it's as simple as uh, when I discipled Jennifer, she wrote it down and kind of made like a formula, and I hate formulas, but relationship from the encounter you have with God to the subsequent relationship that follows. She wrote down, just for her own benefit, F, 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 first, feel, forgive. And our website is forgive. One, two, three. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get any simpler. She just said that she closed her eyes and said, God, fix me. Jennifer had a Bible school president. We tell this every other week, don't we? Bible school president, a school psychologist, a competent missionary who wrote Jennifer off as intelligent but too emotionally damaged to ever amount to anything. Because her experience as a Christian counselor was very little results. Every now and then, somebody gets helped, but by and large, very little results. So she formed a theology, even though she's a Bible school president, she formed a theology that unless you're pretty well adjusted when you get saved, that's a terrible theology, but unless you're pretty well adjusted when you get saved, you only go so far. That is utter nonsense. I've seen what people would have called a basket case become leaders that were healthy. And then I've seen people who thought they were healthy become basket cases. All right, no, we won't go there. But here's the part that you need to understand. I'm going to close with this. This is for the benefit of those watching. And this is the first time they ever heard anything, so this is like overwhelming information. But I found the biggest mistake when we traveled church to church was people didn't even know how to do something as simple as forgive. They forgave from the heart. Now, the scripture says only God can forgive sin. And the scripture says, unless you forgive, your heavenly father won't forgive you. So who does the forgiving? You and God, that's right. The new creation you, from the heart, it's both of you. When you forgive from the head, it's just you. And apart from him, that you can do nothing. But the new creation you, from the heart, Matthew 18 says, unless you forgive from the heart. We saw Christians struggle forgiving. I've been trying to forgive for a year now, that person that... I guarantee you they are sincere, but they are sincerely wrong doing it from their head. It doesn't take a year. It's instant. Just like when you receive Jesus for the first time. First person or situation that comes to mind. We're going to pray for a bit of root right now. F, F, F. First feel forgive. Close your eyes. 
Now, we're going to let God do it, not you picking and choosing, but just whatever pops up. The first person or situation, Lord, we want to deal with a bitter root, anything that's marring my image of the world around me, people and circumstances, anything that's interfering with people and circumstances, any judgments, even if I forgot about it. Lord, you know what's important. You knit me together. I want you to do the searching. The first person or situation that comes to mind, right where you're at now, I want you to just nod your head. You don't have to understand it. Just the first person or situation. All right, that person or situation has an emotion behind it. Down in the gut, the seat of the emotions, allow yourself to feel the feeling that's attached to that person or situation momentarily. Now let Jesus down there in the gut, in your the door of the heart, the will. I let Jesus the forgiver, me and Jesus the forgiver, out of my belly. I'm releasing forgiveness right through that hurt, and he's washing it out, and he takes it with him. Out of my belly flows rivers of loving forgiveness. It's flowing out toward that person that I see in my mind's eye. I have peace in my gut, and I can see the person in my mind's eye. That means there was a supernatural transaction. If you can see the person in your mind's eye, but you still feel an ugly feeling in the gut, you didn't let Jesus go to the gut and take away the feeling and let forgiveness flow from the heart. I let forgiveness flow from the heart. When it changes to peace, you nod your head. And it is that easy. It's the same way you get saved. As you received him when you got saved, so walk. Colossians 2, 6. As you received him, how did you receive him? You asked him to come into your heart, cleanse you of your sin, and there was peace. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's stand to your feet. <clears throat> Father, we pray that in the days ahead, you're going to give us the eyes of Jesus as we welcome you to work on our heart, that we would have the heart of Jesus and that we would see things from your perspective and not our carnal, fleshly perspective. And so, Father, too, uh, we, we're going to bless them, speak good words about people who perhaps have not spoken good words about us. Bless them right now. Anyone that's spoken ill will about you, just bless them. I bless them. Anyone that's persecuted, I release. <laughs> I have to laugh on that one. I am releasing blessing on all the people who say, I hate that book. I didn't read it, but I hate it anyway. I just know it. That's like saying, I love that movie. I never saw it, but I just love it. <laughs> Bless those people. They actually have something going on inside of them that really needs ministry, don't they? They're hurt. They're the victim. I'm not the victim of negative uh, reviews. They have something in them that needs fixed. They're the victim. I release the loving power of God and the redemption that could be there. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.